capstone design and closing this afternoon in this room? We, it's not the last not the last. presentation after this. In here? In here. Oh, I didn't know that. Sorry, Brian. Go ahead and correct me. Thanks so much. That's why Brian's here. I'd like to introduce our distinguished uh, reviewing panel. We've got Mr. Ed Burnett uh, from Lockheed Palmdale and uh, Dan Carraway from what I used to call McDonald Douglas in St. Louis, which is now only St. Louis. AJ Olson, who works at Sierra Nevada in Denver on one of my favorite subjects, which are uh, ISR. Of all kinds. And Jacob Alder from China Lake, who does all sorts of RDT and E for the Navy there. And uh, we also have our Steve Chancellor, Frank Harris, who I think, weren't you a B 52 squadron commander? So? I just came for the bomber stuff. Okay, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have so to find any of I just drive them. Any other folks that see Jim Helton in here? Hey, there. He is fine. Hang on. <laughs> Brian Davis is right there. Any big notes? Anybody I miss that I don't know? Uh, let me introduce uh, the program manager for uh, Team Daedalus, uh, who are working on um, a project that uh, is in response to the recent Air Force solicitation for a B-2 replacement. Sheree Gambino will introduce her team. Thank you, Dr. Chrysler. So as Dr. Chrysler said, my name is Shri Gambino. I'm the program manager for the YB3 Daedalus design team. Today we'll be going through uh, these topics briefly. We'll go through our introduction, uh, some analysis of alternatives and requirements that we have conducted, as well as our final uh, design configuration, our wind tunnel results, um, our final iteration results, some risk reduction and trade studies that we conducted based on those results, and of course our conclusions and recommendations. So real quick, uh, this is our team. We have Jeremy Smith, he's our chief engineer. Uh, we then have Eric Maynard, who is our aerodynamics and performance IPT lead. We have Alex Warner, who's our propulsion and structures IPT lead. Our stability and controls IPT lead, um, Eduardo Manrique. Our landing gear IPT, Ricardo Fernandez. And last but not least, our flight deck design and risk analysis IPT lead, Michael McElhaney. So moving on, um, as I was briefly mentioned earlier, this design uh, meets our requirements for the capstone course of detailed design. It presents all of the work that we have done in the last two semesters. And then of course it satisfies the uh, Air Force's need for the new long range strike bomber. So when we initially began looking into designing a long range strike bomber, we first looked at redesigning the B-2. However, the Air Force requires the new LRSV be at a per unit cost of $500 million. Currently, the B-2 costs $2.21 billion to produce per unit, so that got thrown out very quickly. Uh, we also looked at the potential for an unmanned bomber. However, if you're going to be using a bomber for nuclear deterrence, you need the human factor involved in that decision-making process. We have also seen relevant precedents uh, such as in the development of the B-1 when the B-52 became operationally deficient for the Air Force's needs, as well as the B-2 when the B-1 again became deficient. Uh, and now is the time to go ahead and build a new bomber. So when we first looked at what this bomber needs, the major concern was the Low Observable Radar Cross Section, or LORCS. We're going to be talking about that a lot during this presentation. We also needed a very high combat radius or range of 7,000 plus nautical miles, an endurance of 14 plus hours, as well as a conventional or nuclear payload capability of 24,000 pounds. We also looked at our different mission requirements, such as in-flight refueling, uh, loiter, and multi-role capabilities. So I will now hand it over to Jeremy Smith for our mission analysis. Thank you, Sheree. A uh, standard mission the YB-3 will be subjected to during its lifetime is a bombing mission. Um, shown here is a fuel burn uh, approximation for the taxi takeoff, ascent to altitude, cruise to target, uh, the expending of the payload, and then cruise home. Uh, it's important to note that, especially with nuclear capability, it was important that we make sure uh, all of our range calculations were with a full payload because there's a possibility that we may not expend that payload at the target. Uh, we also have the capability of performing one or more in-flight refuelings depending on mission. 
I'm now going to talk about the configuration, or the final configuration for YD3. The most important driving uh, factor for this design was the LORCS capability, and many of the things that we took into account include high and low frequency um, radar, uh, both passive and active search, as well as the infrared detection. Um, due to the limited capabilities that we had, we were forced to stick with just rule of thumb shaping when it comes to the stealth shaping, which basically states that all, all of the uh, edges of the aircraft should conform to the leading edges as much as possible, and all other compartments or openings on the aircraft should be uh, slotted so that they match um, any of the radar spikes. This is a six spike aircraft, um, and that is shown up here in this picture. Uh, the primary spike directions as well as their relative magnitudes from our uh, projections. Um, shown over here are the inlets and nozzles. The inlets and nozzles are on the top of the aircraft to help shield them from ground-based radar. They are also uh, slanted to match the leading and trailing edges of the wings, again, for that RCS. Uh, the inlets are offset to uh, block the fan face from oncoming radar. And we also implemented turning vanes inside that to completely shield the fan face. Uh, additionally, in the back of the aircraft, the nozzles, because they're on the top, we're going to be uh, following in the YF-23's um, standard of having the heat tiling on the back of that to help absorb heat before it leaves the uh, tail of the aircraft uh, to minimize the uh, IR detection capabilities. Uh, IR is also mitigated by our engine choice because we have a high bypass turbo fan. The exhaust temperature is much lower than that of, for instance, the V2. As an overview, the final, the final design has a maximum gross takeoff weight of 194,000 pounds. We have a uh, empty fuel weight, or an empty weight of 70,000 pounds and a fuel weight of 94,000 pounds. We uh, cruise at Mach 0.82 at a Reynolds number of 32 million. We have a uh, um, CL max of 1.2 and a CE min of uh, 0.0187 and a maximum thrust available at sea level of 68,000 pounds. We took these numbers and did a weight fraction comparison with multiple comparable bomber aircraft, including the B-1, the B-2, uh, the F-111 strike aircraft, as well as the uh, TU-22, which is Russian. And this shows that our weight fractions are on par with these other aircraft. We're now going to talk about the development of our wind tunnel model. The wind tunnel model was designed in Katia as a 148 scale model of the full-size aircraft and was broken up to be uh, printed here at the Embry River Rapid Prototyping Lab. The substructure of it is made of aluminum and stainless steel, and here you see the here you see the main spar. Um, that is designed so that it slips into the wing to allow for ease of change of the variations that we did within the model. Shown here is an isometric view that highlights those parametric variations. Our wing tips, we looked at a standard pointed tip and then a clip tip configuration. The outer wing has a clean and then an aileron deployed configuration for uh, positive roll. The inner wing was clean and then also had a flat deployed configuration, and the tail had a clean as well as a 10 degree deflected configuration and a tail off configuration. Some of those are shown here. We do have a split flap that was deployed at 40 degrees. Our clip tip we decided to investigate at the recommendation of Daryl Cummings, who was the chief configurator on the YF-23, and he suggested we investigate this because there is a possibility of aerodynamic gains to be had by clipping that tip because pointed tips are uh, typically stalled on most aircraft. And because we already have a side spike on the aircraft for RCS purposes due to the fuselage, this would not significantly degrade the RCS return. The uh, deflected tail was 10 degrees, despite the fact the all-moving tail can move up to 40 degrees. 10 degrees was chosen specifically due to the structural limitations of the RP plastic. Um, if we were to rotate that anymore, we uh, found through testing um, and uh, our predictions in Katia that it would not be structurally sound in the wind tunnel, and so we had to stick with only 10 degrees. Uh, we allotted $1,000 of our budget towards our wind tunnel model, and most of that went towards the 3D printing cost of all the different parts, and the rest of it going towards paint for flow bids and the substructure uh, hardware. I'm now going to pass it off to Eric Maynard for the wind tunnel testing results. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, so here's the wind tunnel that we use. This is on the other middle ground. This is the Tracy Dorothy wind tunnel. It's a closed circuit, or a closed loop wind tunnel. Uh, it has a cross section. Uh, in the test section, it's three foot by four foot, three foot high, four feet wide. This was good for our 148 scale model. This um, gave us about nine inches on either side of the wing from the wall, so we didn't have to worry about wall corrections. Uh, other test parameters included a free string velocity of 130 feet per second. And this resulted in a Reynolds number, about 300,000. 
this picture, we can see how well-centered that the model is in the wind tunnel. Um, this was good for us because we didn't have to worry that high was intact when it was hitting the ceiling of the tunnel, nor did we have to worry about the buffing from that uh, upper surface. From the wind tunnel data, we uh, this is the graph that we got. The ABL data was our preliminary design prediction. Uh, what's not pictured here was our CL max of about 1.2 and our stall angle of attack of 16 degrees. But with the solid black line, you can see here, we have a stall angle of 18 degrees and a maximum seal of about 0 0.9. There is a correction for that 0 0.9, we'll discuss that later. But you can also see that even though we stall here, um, we do maintain lift, and that will also be explained uh, later as well. This is our drag puller. Again, we have our predicted ABL data. Um, ABL is an invisible program, that's why there's no maximums on that. Uh, however, we do see about uh, 0 0.8. Uh, we do get our drag spike, and this indicates that our stall is occurring. And this is our pitching moment. Uh, we have our max gross takeoff weight and our half CG. The max gross takeoff weight, we are pitch stable uh, to about 10 degrees, and then we go pitch unstable. However, uh, most of the flight regime of the aircraft it doesn't go above 10 degrees angle of attack. Um, so we won't have to worry so much about that, but to mitigate the risk, we've implemented the control wall so we can control the So that doesn't happen. On our half CG, this is the worst case scenario. This is plug fuel tanks at the rear. We have an empty uh, bomb bay. And that was also uh, part of the premium calculations. And it does go pitch on stable about 60 degrees. Yet again, we won't really be flying in that um, high angle of attack. Uh, we can get the investigation of our flaps deployed. We can see we do have a slight shift, a little um, higher in the CL alpha, and uh, a much lower uh, alpha zero. This uh, was the clip tip uh, investigation. We can see we do lose lift, and we have. Um, less uh, stalling angle of attack, about 17 degrees as opposed to the 18. This is the drag puller for that clip tip investigation. Uh, we do see we have our drag <coughs> much sooner than the configuration that we have before. Then we investigated uh, what would happen if we took off the tail of the aircraft. And we can see here we definitely have a reduction in drag. However, we do stall a little bit sooner than uh, the clean configuration with the tail on. And this is the pitching moment of the uh, tail and tailless uh, aircraft. We have this before. And we can also see about 60 degrees starts to go to the pitch unstable. And yet again, a control lock would be implemented for the other control surfaces to mitigate uh, any instability issues beyond that flight region. Then uh, we investigated the deflection of our tail. Again, if we deflect it at 10 degrees, though it can deflect the maximum to 40 degrees. And we see we don't have the authority for pitch with 10 degrees, but with uh, more angle of attack on the uh, pitching tail, we can rotate to take off, and we're pitch save off to the 10 degree point. 10 degrees angle of attack. This is a chart of our LED max compared to our uh, lift coefficient. We see that we get a uh, LED max about 15, and this would result in a endurance of about 17 hours, which I'll also discuss later. This is the uh, um, CL configuration I mentioned earlier. These three points in the bottom left here were taken from the wind tunnel data at the low Reynolds numbers. And then the rest of these points up here were used with uh, XFOIL to analyze a combination of the airflow to see at the higher Reynolds numbers what we do. The way this extrapolation occurred, it was a method called Jacob's method that we used. And what it is is that it follows a trend of a little S bend and eventually um, approaches an asymptote. Now, our target Reynolds number is about 32 million since we don't have the computing power or the skill set uh, to analyze at that flight regime. The extrapolation was good enough to be able to predict a CL maximum of about 1.2. Here we have our flow visualization of our test. On the left, you can see an angle of attack of zero degrees. You see all the, uh, the tufts, the straight, parallel, it's good flow. However, at the angle of attack of 18 degrees, this is at the cusp of our stalling angle of attack. And we can see here, from this point out, that wing is mostly stalled, and we do stall at this point. However, in the middle there, um, because of the geometry of our uh, aircraft, we do predict that, through this geometry, that that is the reason we continue to gain lift. And you can see that some of the flow is uh, still straight and parallel, and becomes more of a lifting surface at this point. I will now hand it over to Alex Murray to give a discussion. Thank you. 
So, uh, for the propulsion systems of the YB3, we elected to use two CFM56 5C4 high bypass turbofans. Each of these turbofans has a bypass ratio of 6.1, a sea level thrust and thrust specific fuel consumption of 34,000 pounds and 0.365 pounds per hour per pound, respectively, and each weigh 8,800 pounds. So, to generate a lot of the plots seen in this section, we use the Wintermark data as well as a free software called PERF. And PERF allows us to model an engine and then generate its thrust characteristics, its uh, mass flow rates and its thrust specific fuel consumption uh, at various speeds, temperatures, and altitudes. <laughs> so here we hold altitude constant at both sea level and 35,000 feet, uh, which is at cruise altitude. And we vary uh, the speed. Uh, which ultimately lets us uh, see throttle settings. As you can see at sea level, we have a very large range of speeds that we can travel, um, still maintain flight. However, at 35,000 feet, this region uh, decreases drastically. However, designated by the marker shown here is the uh, specified cruise condition of the YV3. And it shows, due to this wide distance, that we don't have to be at 100% throttle. Uh, for this set of plots, we now hold speed constant at Mach 0.82 and vary our altitude. Uh, figure 30 on the right, or on your left, shows uh, that at our cruise altitude of 35,000 feet, we have a total thrust output of about 7,500 pounds, while our thrust specific fuel consumption is about 0.575. We, in this plot, we hold a constant speed of Mach 0.82, a constant weight of 194,000 pounds, and we're able to identify a, absolute, or a service ceiling of 36,000 feet and an absolute ceiling of 37,000 feet. Uh, it's important to note that these margins were uh, larger using our prelim estimated coefficient of drag, however, it has decreased marginally as a result of our wind tunnel data. So as Jeremy said earlier, we have the implementation of notches on our leading edge of our inlet, as well as turning vanes within the ducting itself. Uh, so because these are a requirement of our stealth aspect, however, they do cause some flow characteristic changes within the aircraft itself. Um, and so because we're using a high bypass turbo fan in a ducted environment, we like it to perform a trade study. Um, in this study, we are looking at two high-production commercial aircraft, the Lockheed L-1011, as well as the Boeing 727, both of which have a, a, an engine in the tail. And because of its lower drag, as well as its easy access for maintenance, is fed by an s -duct. <coughs> So for the Lockheed L-1011, we have an engine diameter of 84.8 inches for the Rolls-Royce RB211, and a total measured offset of 33%. For the Boeing 727, which uses a Pratt Whitney JTAD-200, it has a diameter of 49.2 inches and a total offset of 43%. So we can use both of these aircraft as our kind of high and low boundaries for offset, and, and, allowed us, and it allows us to assume that for an engine, with higher diameter and thus higher mass flow rate, the allowable total offset for that ducting is smaller. While with the 727, a uh, smaller low bypass turbo fan is able to have a larger uh, total offset. So now we can look at the YV3, which uses the CFM 56-5C4 uh, that has an engine diameter of 75.4 inches, um, and we have a measured total offset of 38% which lies about right in the middle of that region. So we can take those percentages and plot them on the figure shown here, taken from the AIAA-83 Survey of Inlet Development for Supersonic Tactical Aircraft. Um, you may note that the YV-3 has displacement both in the Z and Y directions. Um, however, from the characteristics of the plot, we can assume uh, constant characteristic flow rates radially about the origin. Um, also note that although the three aircraft shown are in the, the blue region, 
that represents uh, additional diffuser methods, uh, method requirements. Uh, this figure is for supersonic tactical aircraft. Um, <coughs> sorry. Additional uh, experiments were performed, specifically at the University of Southern California, that compared the total uh, pressure recovery between a straight circular duct and an S duct with 22% offset uh, with and without vortex generators. Uh, from this experiment, they showed that a straight circular duct has a <clears throat> total pressure recovery of 93%, while the S duct uh, with 22% offset and no vortex generators has a 90% total pressure recovery. With, however, the in installation of vortex generators, we see a 91% total pressure recovery. As well as that increase in total pressure recovery, um, there was also a reduction in the phenomenon called puddling, which is the slowing and stagnation of the flow within the duct itself. Um, some conclusions taken from this study um, that were by the University of Southern California were that uh, better, more systematic placement of these vortex generators can result in a higher total pressure recovery, which is worth looking into. Um, additionally, both the Lockheed L-1011 and the Boeing 727 uh, use vortex generators to help uh, turn their flow as well. I'll now be handing it off to Eric Maynard for performance. Thank you, Alex. Okay, this diagram here, uh, this one is our constraints uh, diagram. This is with the, uh, the updated information of our aircraft, so this basically tells us the optimal performance point of our aircraft. So you can see we have a wing loading, about 58 uh, pounds per square foot, and it also gives us a thrust to weight ratio of about 0 0.38. Moving on, we have our specific excess energy plot. Uh, this tells us a few things. This tells us our maximum altitude is about 37,000 feet, and then our max uh, speed is about Mach 0.92 at 24,000 feet. It also gives us a rate of climb about 3,000 feet per minute. And this is with max gross takeoff rate. So as we burn fuel these lines, we need to expand and we will get more performance out of the aircraft. This is our turning diagram for the YB3. We have a maximum uh, wing loading of about 3 Gs. We're not, we're not a fighter, we're a bomber, so we don't need to be highly maneuverable. However, this in cases of missiles or surface air missiles or other threats, it can perform uh, small maneuvers to be able to get away from the threat. We also see that we have a max lift that gives us a turning rate of about 5,800 feet at a turn rate of 70 feet per second. And this uh, slide here tells us the other various aspects of our aircraft. We have a balanced takeoff distance, about 14,000 feet, so that's about, and we, our takeoff distance is 7,300 feet, and uh, that allows us to clear 50 foot obstacles as well, and gives us a landing uh, rolling distance of about 7,800 feet. We see that we have an absolute ceiling, about 37,000, with a surface of 36,000 feet, and our cruise altitude of 35. We get a maximum range of 7,300 nautical miles with the max endurance of 17 hours. And to calculate all of these, uh, we attribute it to the equations of uh, John Anderson. And we use all these uh, parameters to make this calculation possible. I'll uh, hand it over to Eduardo Fabrique to talk about the Thank you, Alex. When designed the empennage of the YB-3, it was established that the VTEL configuration was the best design choice. Some advantages of the VTEL are that it's better for stealth, has fewer control surfaces, which can lead, which leads to less drag. However, there are some disadvantages with the VTEL configuration, where the uh, elevator and rudder control surfaces are coupled, which can be problematic during some recovery. There are also higher loads on the VTEL, which can lead to um, more structural support in that region, which can lead to more uh, more weight. At this point, it was essential to maintain the 30 degree dihedral to maintain um, uh, cell capabilities. And when sizing the uh, VTEL, it was essential to uh, also break down the effective break down the VTEL into effective horizontal and effective vertical tail areas. This led to a stable YB3 F flat condition with the following static stability derivatives. 
CM alpha, which is the fission moment coefficient, and CL beta, which is the low moment coefficient due to side slip, and CN beta, which is the um, yaw moment coefficient due to side slip. For the, for the first three, CM alpha and CL beta, it should be negative, and uh, CN beta should be positive. Here you can see the results from the, um, from the estimated values and wind tunnel uh, results. However, due to the limited time and, uh, and the significant amount of tests that we've conducted, we were only able to um, extrapolate uh, CM alpha. Um, here you can see that CM alpha for both the estimated and the wind tunnel results were um, relatively close. Um, during the wind tunnel um, testing conducted this semester, uh, preliminary CG location uh, locations were used. Uh, this led to a, a pitch unstable of YB3 at the most apt CG location test condition. Um, this led to uh, more in-depth analysis on fuel burn sequence to mitigate any problems. Two analyses were done where we took into consideration um, an organized fuel burn sequence which would cause CG to ship um, uh, shift forward, which could potentially cause the static margin to be too high. The second analysis was where we took into consideration the possibility of having trap fuel, which could shift the CG for, uh, backwards, which could potentially cause a wide degree to become pigeon state during play. In this figure, you can see the fuel, per, um, the fuel tank numberings as well as the fuel burn sequence on the right hand side. Um, when the, the trap fuel analysis took into consideration potentially having 13, 14 fuel tanks plugged and having um, all three 12, 13, and 14 fuel tanks plugged. The reason why these three tanks were taken into consideration were because they were so far back from the aerodynamic center that um, that these were the most problematic to uh, having pitch on stable Y3. Um, with that said, we took um, fuel burn analysis uh, for CG travel uh, for mass payload and no payload, uh, for all three test conditions of having no plug fuel tanks, having two, uh, 13 and 14 plugs, and having fuel tanks 12, 13, and 14 plugs. Um, with that said, uh, the red tape marks correspond to 10% useful fuel, and for all, for all these test conditions, the YV3 does, um, the CG shift does uh, go further aft with uh, fuel burn. Here you can see the static margin travel for the both, both test conditions for max payload and no payload. Um, and you can see for the YV3 does, does not cross the um, one per, or zero um, line for both cases. However, it is important to notice that, to note that the, uh, according to Marcelo Napolitano, uh, larger aircraft such as transport and bombers uh, static margin should be within 15 uh, to 25 percent, and for most of the flight regime, the YP3 does stay within that range. However, at lower fuel uh, percentages, the YP3 does dip below that. Uh, the YP3 does become pitch unstable, or the static margin does dip below zero percent uh, at the most um, when plug, when tanks 12, 13, and 14 are plugged. The worst case scenario. It's also important to note that the YV3, in, in the event that there are plug, plug field tanks, the YV3 will be grounded and um, the, that problem will be assessed. In the event convention out scenario, it is also important to take into account the minimum control speed required to maintain control of the aircraft. And here you can see um, that it is 160 feet per second when compared to um, 230 feet per second for the V stall. Therefore, the, it, that is favorable during an engine out due to the fact that you want to stall uh, before you lose control of the aircraft. As far as the bin recovery, the weight cell configuration doesn't pose a significant threat. However, there is only um, during the spin recovery process, there are some uh, weight cell configuration does pose a problem when you need both um, full rudder and full elevator deflections and when the, when those control surfaces are coupled, it can be problematic. Now I'll pass it off to Alex Warner. Thank you. So a few things to note about the YV3 structures are first is versatility. 
Uh, we have theorized the implementation of interchangeable bulkheads within the Bombay. Um, those configurations will be shown later by Michael. Uh, but this would allow us to use two 15-foot rotary launchers or three 10-foot rotary launchers. As far as the structural materials themselves go, they're using 7075-T6 aluminum tubing um, at high stress concentration areas, such as the uh, root of the wing, as well as that wing transition point. Um, at uh, most other parts of the aircraft where stress is, uh, has been calculated to be lower, we're using 2024-G3 aluminum, which is the most common aluminum for structural, uh, the most common aluminum for aircraft structures. Um, we have estimated a 12-inch diameter spindle um, for our all-moving tail surface. This is to ensure that we have ample structural stability for uh, the various flight conditions that we have predicted. All of this totals for a structural weight of 30,000 pounds. So to verify that uh, this model is correct, we have elected to perform finite element analysis using the TOV5 here at the school's computers. In order to do this, our conditions are as follows. Lift equals weight, which is 194,000 pounds. Uh, we're assuming a 3G pull-up and a factor of safety of 1.5. Note that 775-T6 has a yield stress of 73 KSI at uh, sea level temperatures. So in order to increase the fineness of our mesh in Katia, and uh, as a result of our computing power, we elected to use half of the aircraft um, using the, the fuselage as uh, constraints or clamps. Um, as far as as far as lift distribution goes, we assumed a 70-30 um, uh, lift ratio, uh, set in the 70% being at the uh, being from the root of the wing to this transition point, and 30% being generated by this smaller point. Uh, using uh, we are you we did we performed this one with a mesh of four by four inches. You can see that we have a, a average stresses of about. 10 to 40 KSI along the wing with small stress concentrations beginning at the uh, wing transition point as well as the root of the wing. Um, in order to kind of verify that this converges, we have now increased the fineness of our mesh to a two by two. Um, and now we can see uh, stress concentrations happening at the same points that are growing in magnitude. And uh, again, we see average stresses of about 40 KSI. However, there are mass stresses that appear here that um, are approaching 150 KSI, which show that uh, the stress will it is larger than our, the yield stress of our material. Uh, the important thing, however, that we've taken from this is that with more and more computing power, we can increase the fineness of our mesh to really get accurate data uh, for our model. Um, and use that for more and more iterations, which we'd expect the weight to increase slightly uh, as we continue. However, that, is, that, that isn't a large problem because the way we have conducted, or we have created all of our data is using Excel. So we're able to update that very quickly. With this two by two mesh, we have also shown the displacement of the wing tip, which is about 166 inches. Again, with further refinements of our, of our model, we can expect this to decrease. Now hand it off to Ricardo Fernandez for managing and Thank you, Alex. So, main landing gear location was primarily chosen based on CG location, uh, existing structures, because we don't want it to add uh, extra structures for landing gear as few as possible and also in volumetric abilities or availability because the old aircraft was already kind of crowded with all the uh, fuel tanks and the engines by it. Um, so based on those constraints, we came up with this uh, location where we have as well some of the main spars coming in into the, air, uh, into the fuselage. So we could attach the main landing gear there and the nose landing gear is well attached to a main bulkhead. Now, we had to make sure that the aircraft was gonna be stable on the ground. So following Ruskin book, we went and we had two criteria to make for stability, which were a feedback criteria, 
which states that your angle here, right there, has to be more than 15 degrees, and that makes sure that your aircraft won't tip back while sitting on the ground. Uh, this is based on your most apt CG. In our case, that is when your aircraft is completely empty, so no payload, no fuel, nothing. So it's actually not very often. Not very often. We only we have an, an angle of 14.98, so we could assume we've met it. And as well, that is not going to happen often. Like I said, maybe only during maintenance. Um, then we have the tip over angle, which is stated that has to be less than 55 degrees, and that is so the aircraft won't tip to the side when doing some maneuvering on the ground, maybe at high speeds. Um, we uh, met that by, that by quite a bit. And lastly, this is not a stability criteria, but it's more of the clearance. So. For during takeoff, we want to add an angle of minimum 15 degrees for takeoff, or at least that's what Ruscom states. Uh, we have a 14.47 clearance. Our aircraft really is going to take off and rotate at 12, so we don't have that problem, and we will have a control lot to prevent the pilot from actually pulling further than that. So uh, we, we assume that that is uh, okay. Um, as far as in the main landing gear design, we as well follow uh, Roscam for tire sizing and as well for uh, shock absorber, absorber sizing. Uh, for this, we assume a 10 uh, feet per second descent and as well uh, braking and dynamic loads on the main and the front landing gear. Um, based on that, we come up with an audio strut of 1 feet diameter and a nose landing gear strut of 0.86 diameter feet, uh, feet. And then, as far as in the configuration for the landing gear, for the nose gear, we have a conventional design, so it's a side-by-side -side wheel. We have one main strut, and then we have a link that is acts as a drag strut. And uh, it, we will have here uh, an actuator, which would pull up, and then it, it will retract the mechanism. As far as in the mainland gear, we had to go with a more unconventional design. So it's been proven to work, and it's been used before, but it's not common to have three wheels uh, in tandem. But we had to go with this because of we didn't have enough root on the set on the wing to fit the larger wheels, or to fit, or even the width to fit the tandem, uh, side by side wheels. Sorry. Well, we went as well with a, a drag strut that acts as well as the main actuator mechanism because we have a very very tight space where the main landing gear goes. Uh, above you can see the okay the animation uh, retraction kinematics for the nose landing gear. So the main actuator for the main landing gear will be pulling uh, this link up while the main landing gear goes, the nose landing gear goes up. And now we have the retraction kinematics for the main landing gear. Here we have, as we spoke, the drag strut that acts as well as the main retraction uh, actuator. But we have a second actuator that rotates the main beam of the wheels because we have that very tight space. We need to make sure we fit that uh, parallel to the main strut. As far as in landing gear and bombing doors, uh, we went with a conventional design. They just pop open to the sides, and they are used. They use a different uh, mechanism. Uh, they are, they are not connected to the main landing gear or to the nose gear mechanism for simplicity. And we didn't have time to actually develop a full system for this. It was kind of outside the scope of this uh, project. Now I will leave you with Michael Michael Henning for ordinance and flight deck. The weapon crew will be able to carry all conventional nuclear and thermonuclear ordnance. This will be um, done by having a reconfigurable bomb bay. Um, this can be shown up here. We will be able to, there's a 32 foot long bomb bay, which will be able to hold either two 15 foot long rotary launchers with a um, bulkhead in the middle or three 10 foot rotary launchers with two bulkheads here. The middle one will be removed and the two will be reinserted um, on these places here. Um, this will all be controlled from the flight deck. The flight deck will be consisting of three members, a pilot, co-pilot, and electronic warfare officer in order to fulfill the multi-role capabilities. The pilot and co-pilot will actually be on a raised platform uh, in the portion of the flight deck. This is to allow for room for the nose gear landing wheel as well as for a better visibility over the nose of the aircraft. Um, all positions will be outfitted with an ejection seat, as well as there is some additional space left over for some uh, personal amenities for the crew. The flight deck um, would be, have a proposed layout similar to this. It would be mostly glass cockpit, 
and due to the size of the flight deck, um, typically the throttle would be shared between the pilot and co-pilot, but because that work is so large, um, we implemented two. Um, this is also for contingency purposes in case something fails. Additionally, all the core buttons and switches for the operating the aircraft would be located in this center console. Um, however, if anything, any remaining room needed, that could also be um, added to the sides of the roof of the flight deck. This is the range of, of visibility for the pilot and co-pilot. As you can see here, they are on a raised platform for this entire flight deck, and the nose gear is about here. Um, this was compared to Rossby's Park 3, which had um, similar degrees of visibility for heavy and transport aircraft, with an average of about 20 above the horizon and 15 below the horizon for the pilot, as well as on the same side, about 130 and 100 degrees um, cross band. Notice this is based on the pilot's point of view um, and not the center of the aircraft. And this is out the um, windscreen of the aircraft. The electronic warfare station was modeled after an Eastman 30H compass call, which is an electronic warfare um, aircraft, and has a very similar um, layout with a multi display um, screen with a multi input keyboard. Again, you can see that it does have an ejection seat here. Lastly, on long duration aircraft, Typically, there is a toilet, as well as some sort of section to stretch or rest. This does have enough room for a standard cot, as well as a small toilet here. Um, there would be a small like, black water tank, and this could be either removed or uh, drained with a hose. And with ease of access, the flight entrance, flight deck entrance or exit is located right here. This is actually directly above the nose gear wheel well, so that entrance would be able to open when it is on the ground. Um, there is a microwave just for eating up food. Uh, that's something that was uh, mentioned in, in research that would be nice, and so we added it if we had some issues. Uh, uh, several operational risks were looked at. Um, most importantly, for taxi takeoff, descent to 90, things like engine failure, locked flaps, and blown tires and tail strikes. Uh, in air, uh, avionics failure or um, plugged fuel tanks for our ordinance delivery, something such as a home store or a failed in-flight refueling um, uh, would be a big risk. Some of the more important ones, uh, the landing gear um, rotation risk would be solved by a control wall, so the plane would not be able to rotate past that point of tail strike, as well as any maneuvering limits would also be controlled with uh, control walls. A fuel pump system would be used to regulate the center of gravity shift, so that, that would not be too harsh on the aircraft and would be a smooth transition. As well as the column for the engine would mitigate any engine failure risks, such as um, part of the blades flying out, it would be contained within the column of the engine. However, if something like this happened, it would be an immediate um, uh, grounding of the aircraft. Uh, lastly, for a rotary, la um, rotary launcher, something is a home store, the ordinance did not uh, drop. It would lock in place, and that can still rotate and drop other ordnance. However, that would be looked at once um, the aircraft lands. I will now pass it off to Sri Gambino for conditions or conditions. Thank you, Michael. So, um, in conclusion, we have determined that this design is convergent with our predictions. Um, however, if there are some recommendations we would like to make. Uh, if another team was to pick this design up, we would. Uh, uh, recommend that they look at the design of the tail and do a couple more iterations of that, um, potentially reduce the size, and if the size is reduced, that they um, implement some drag modifiers onto the ailerons. So with that, um, this is everything that we covered today. So if you have any questions, um, there are your topics. I will now like to open it up to questions from the panel.
Um, I used other um, sources such as Roscom and they, they were saying something between 10 and 15 for military bombers and I also um, we did some more research for places that were saying anywhere between uh, 10 to 40 uh, percent. So it was kind of ranging everywhere and I actually talked to a professor here on campus and he said um, a range between 15 and 25 is, uh, is a good range. It's great, however it costs you. It is a killer range. So, you know, you yeah. can probably be fly by wire. So yeah. once you make that leap, you might want to try to get to become a mutually stable vehicle to take advantage of less trim drag. One of the things to think about. Um, not a whole lot of other uh, quality control analysis I could have put. Like we've seen a little bit more there, but understand we were focusing on other things. Um, and there are some definite things, as you said, going looking at the tail and being able to, to move the load from the tail back into the rest of the airplane without having the airplane perform, I think would be a big, big player. Um, uh, you know, I can't really say too much about it, but you know, the idea of trying to, with the skill set and the tools that you have in the university, um, try to make a vehicle with a little cross-section probably is a lot to take on. So congratulations. All right, very good job. Again, a lot of information covered, uh, a lot of great things done. There's actually something I saw you guys do that I uh, haven't seen done, and it's actually not done in industry as much as we'd expect it to do, and it is uh, actually pretty amazing to see at this level. So where that is, slide 57 and 58, you don't have to pull them up, it's all right. It's just your pen results. Um, what, I guess, explain to me why you guys went with four inch elements and two inch elements and what your thought process was there and why you made that decision. He's handing them to me primarily because I was the CAD guy and so because everything was designed in Katia and this was a somewhat of a uh, complicated structure rather than trying to recreate an ancestor, we went ahead and visit Katia. Uh, the reason for that was. Um, the four inch choice was somewhat arbitrary, but as far as one from four inch to two inch for the refinement, that was, as Alex said, um, to check for convergence with them. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And why do you check for convergence? Um, well, for one, to verify that your data that you're, you're getting out of that is accurate, but primarily uh, to make sure that you don't have uh, trends tending off to infinity, uh, which in some cases there were areas of stress concentration that they identified that we would have to go back in and we look at those sections. Yeah, perfect. That's that's what I wanted to point out and have you explain. Was uh, doing this is um, I do this at work all the time, and my boss will always ask me why are you doing this. I explain to them the same things that you just explained. So it's a very fundamental concept that I think we need to really put more emphasis on because a lot of times we make these models and they're not so good. So um, this is one way to ensure that you do have a good model. And I would say the next step for you guys, the backup slides, it showed uh, VN diagrams, or VM, share a moment. Just take that and do a hand count. Tell me what kind of stress you're getting at the wind group. Some very basic stuff, uh, getting equations, and then you can make a table after these charts and say, look, this is what we got. We're gonna be able to make this work structurally and move on. And it's just a, a very great thing to be able to do early on in a, in a program you can say that the structure is a real risk. So, um, very, very good job there. Uh, the only other question I had for you, which is a little more difficult, on slide 59, you show me deflections. So, 166 inches is a lot, yeah. um, over 12 feet, right? So, I don't know if that's uh, to scale. Um, primarily, I've worked on small aircraft, so I'm not used to seeing that. So, maybe that's in the ballpark of what some other aircraft are. Uh, my question to you, which, think about it for a second. As you increase the mesh size, does your deflection change? Uh, well, as we'd expect to see higher stress is shown, I think we would expect to see our mesh 
our, uh, our displacement increase as a result of those higher stresses accumulating. So not quite. Now your stress will go up, you're right. The reason why is because P over A is stress, right? So you're changing the area elements and that will go up um, because you're decreasing the area. Now deflections, they don't go up. The reason why is because uh, FEM is P equals K times delta. So your stiffness does not change because you are representing whatever elements physically the same way. You're just putting more of them in there. So deflections, you probably wouldn't see change as much. So be careful when you say some of those things um, between stress and deflections. Um, that's the other key area. Um, if you get both of those two things right, you ace the thing for the test. So good job, guys. So I have to say I'm a little disappointed. I was hoping to see more of the RF stuff, especially after talking to you for so much, Jerry. Um, <laughs> trust me, I understand. That. Um, but I do have a couple of questions since you do emphasize the little observable cross-section stuff. Now you mentioned that a lot of the design was based around rules of thumb. And I was just curious where those rules of thumb come from simply because depending on where you look at the spectrum, things can change. Uh, that is true. Um, most of our information, obviously because of the sensitive nature of it, uh, is, is just open source and what we can find um, on things like hot air power. And um, our professor provided to us a packet of excerpts from multiple textbooks in which these things were mentioned, and that was basically uh, more or less our only information on that. And so again, the idea of general shaping, um, because the, the whole idea of LO is beyond the scope of, of undergrad, Capabilities. Uh, basically, all we can do is uh, all of the shaping, matching the spikes, and then hiding the fan face. And then we also took into account a weight penalty for things like RAM, um, which I don't think was mentioned, but uh, we took a 1% penalty into the empty weight uh, to account for the adding of RAM. Okay. And my other question probably stems from my lack of understanding of Air Force operations versus Navy operations. But I noticed you mentioned that you have a position for a slot in there for a key load. And I was curious as to why. Uh, that was primarily to fulfill the idea of multi-role, so that um, you could realistically have two of these things flying into a target, one uh, acting as a decoy with a full sensor sweep, um, and the other one actually delivering the ordnance. So the idea is that you could insert a uh, full sensor sweep into the ordnance bay instead of ordnance. Um, and then the other deal with that is uh, that, that you can use this for missions beyond just um, bombing, that you can do it for uh, any, anything else that, that could be useful with that, the Air Force. Okay. Work guys, a lot of work in a very short amount of time. Thank you. I'm looking at a comparison between slides 23 and 48. Can you go to 23 for me, please? The first question is why is weight important? It's a label there, and it's that one actually is supposed to be for a forward CG line. Uh, the reason weight was important was because um, as we lose weight, our CG shifts backward. So that, that was the whole reason we looked at the comparison between the two weights. So it, that one has actually effectively more a description of a CG location. Correct. Okay. You need to be careful with that. You're dealing with a non dimensional coefficient up there. So it makes me think that you're talking about something that's not dimensional. But in looking at that solid black curve now in relation to slide 48, the wind tunnel results value uh, comment up there about stable cruise conditions with Paul and derivatives. What is that 0.768? Where where on that curve in slide 23 is that point taken around? Uh, with the from that curve is the, init, the initial slope, the initial negative slope, where it, uh, it's pretty much the area where we will be trimming it. So that's the, the trim condition. Okay, uh, that's what I was expecting, and that's what I was uh, expecting to hear, so that's good. Um, you're right, you're stable in that spot. You, you went through and you addressed this quite a bit. Just want to point it out again. You hit that point at 10 degrees. Slope that line reverses. You can't do that because you have, I mean, you, you have specified that your stalls are up in a 15 ish degree range. So, yeah, 
right, your stable down is a little attack range, but that's something that needs to be addressed before you actually consider yourself like a little flyable vehicle for all your player in the world. Uh, last question, <clears throat> slide 45. Those field length distances are ginormous. Yes. Uh, did you consider, I assume those are steel level values, those are steel level lengths, which means as you go up in altitude, they only get worse right, for higher field level seats. Did you consider uh, take off flap settings or anything of the nature? Because your balance field length of 14,000 feet is almost going to rule out the majority of usable airfields to in the country immediately. Okay. Uh, one of the ideas that was tossed around was taking off and with about half the fuel weight and having it uh, do a mid every fuel before continuing around to its target. But, um, yeah, this was for max that, Yeah, that's a, it's a viable solution. This is obviously not ideal, but it's a viable solution. But did you consider a takeoff flap setting? I, the, the airplane that I am working on is that's very about flaps. We right. did talk about the idea of having flaps and how that would probably be necessary, uh, but that wasn't implemented in these numbers. Okay. I even work on a really small, light, single engine turbo prop right now, and the takeoff flap setting now is 15 degrees. They don't even do a, a clean. Yeah, it, it is, and um, because that was not looked into here, actually, like, like we said, um, we considered that takeoff flaps would probably be necessary. Um, also, if you notice on the wind tunnel page where it looked at the flap to 40 degrees, there was not a whole lot of effect there. There was a slight upward shift, but it wasn't what we were expecting. That's primarily due to the very small flap area that we chose. Um, so if we would go back and look at that, uh, we consider possibly increasing the flap area. And that was also the inner wing flaps. Um, yeah, um, when he was mentioning his flap arms. Um, we have the large aileron surfaces on the outer wing that were not considered as possible flaps, um, which could be as well. Perfect. Uh, high deflections like that typically just turn the barn doors that are there and you can drag them up. Nice. So you have for a takeoff type of setting, you're exactly right. You need to look at some of the configuration pieces of it, but you're probably going to look at the function that's considerable. That's going to be all part of the trade offs and different things on. Great job, guys. Thank you. One thing I got asked, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got a point down. So, I think it was slide 56. <laughs> okay, so what does that top line say? Uh, you have a 3G, you got a 3G maneuver? Yes. Lift equal weight when you're pulling 3G? Well, so. so. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what load did you apply to the wing? So it was uh, 194,000 pounds, which is lift equals weight, times 3, for 3 Gs, times 1.5 for our vector take. Okay. So that was uh, our base value, and then times 3, times 1.5. Yeah. So I guess it wasn't yeah. uh, illustrated. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all I got. I got a lot more, but I'm not going <laughs> to. Professor Davis? Oh, just only as a sole representative of the Bomber Pilot Union in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I would always like to have more thrust. I was commenting, I saw the 7 to 14,000 foot numbers, and I said, Yes, that's a long way to roll. So I thought this is a beautiful design and a beautiful aircraft and really well carried out on all of you. But I'd always like a little more thrust. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions?